Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Judy Krasna. I'm the Executive Director of FEAST, and I'd like to start us off today with a few housekeeping items. First, thank you for joining us. Again, kindly mute yourselves upon entering the webinar and turn off your video. Um, and make sure that your camera and your video are shut off during the entire webinar, please. And if you have questions for Dr. Katzman, you can just put them in the chat box. And toward the end of the webinar, there's gonna be time for questions and she will answer as many as possible. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katzman, who is a professor of pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics and University of Toronto and senior associate scientist at the research assistant at SickKids. She co-established the Eating Disorders Program at SickKids in 1993. Dr. Katzman is the Director of Health Science Research in the MD program at the University of Toronto. She is the past president of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine and the Academy for Eating Disorders and is a fellow of both. The focus of Dr. Katzman's research program has been to study the unique physiologic and developmental issues in children and adolescents with eating disorders. She has published over 150 articles, abstracts, book chapters, and editorials. Dr. Katzman co-edited a book for parents on eating disorders and is editor-in-chief for an adolescent medicine textbook. She has received several awards for her work. Perhaps less notable, but important to us, Dr. Katzman is a treasured member of the FEAST advisory panel, and we are thrilled to have her here with us today, Dr. Katzman. Just getting my slides up here. So can everybody see my slides? Is this okay? I'm assuming that's a yes. Yes, we can see them. Okay, just let me get rid of this. Great. So thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Judy. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to present to you today. A special thanks to you, Judy, and the staff at FEAST for this lovely invitation. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that this presentation is being delivered on the lands of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and the, recently the Mississauga of the Credit River, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people here in Canada. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community on this territory. And this is my disclosure slide. These disclosures here will have no impact on the content of my presentation today. So let's begin. And my hope is at the conclusion of my presentation that you as the participants will be able to recognize children and adolescents with eating disorders. Be aware that children and adolescents with eating disorders have unique medical complications and appreciate that children and adolescents with eating disorders, in fact, do recover. So I'm gonna start off with a rather rhetorical question, and that is why do we look at eating disorders in children and adolescents? So from my own clinical and research experience, eating disorders are being identified in younger and younger children. We're seeing young people with uh, ARFID who are two and three years old and young people with anorexia nervosa that are five and six years old. We know that eating disorders affect children of all ages, genders, races, ethnicities, body weights, sexual orientations and socioeconomic statuses. And we also know that the clinical presentation of young people with eating disorders is distinctly different than that of adults. These young people have significant medical and psychiatric complications that result in consequences that, if not identified early and treated aggressively, may not be reversible. These are chronic conditions in adolescence. And eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. Children and adolescents are six to 10 times more likely to die from these disorders than their healthy peers. So before I get into the medical complications, I thought I'd just review with you the various eating disorders that are outlined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition that was published in 2013. Young people with anorexia nervosa 
restrict their intake. And this leads to significantly low body weight in the context of their age, sex, development, and physical health. They also have an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, or they have behaviors that actually interfere with weight gain, even though they may be at a significantly low weight. These young people have disturbances in the way in which they perceive or experience their body weight, shape, or size, or they have a lack of recognition of just how serious uh, these disorders are and their low body weight is. Patients with bulimia nervosa have recurrent episodes of binge eating, and these binge eating episodes um, can include eating anywhere from 4,000 to 9,000 kilocalories in a very short period of time. And these young people um, are really um, at sort of distance from the, the whole experience. They have recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors that follow the binge eating. And these behaviors consist of laxatives, diuretics, diet pills, exercise, fasting, and restricting. The binge and inappropriate compensatory behaviors both occur on average at least once a week for three months. Binge eating disorder is also commonly found in patients, um, young people with uh, eating disorders. These young people have recurrent episodes of binge eating, very much like what I just described in patients with bulimia nervosa. But in addition to that, pe young people with binge eating disorder uh, should have, in order to make this diagnosis, three or more of eating rapidly, feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts when they're not really hungry, and then having feelings of embarrassment or depression or guilt or marked distress regarding their binge eating. These binge eating episodes, unlike those with bulimia nervosa, do not have inappropriate compensatory behaviors. And then a relatively new diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is that of Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or as we commonly refer to it, ARFID. Young people with ARFID have eating or feeding disturbances where they fail to meet their appropriate energy needs, and that can lead to any one of the following. They can have significant weight loss, or in young children, failure to achieve expected weight gain or have faltering growth. They can have significant nutritional deficiencies, and an example of this could be iron deficiency anemia or low bone mineral density, which we'll talk about in a moment. These young people can be dependent on enteral feeding. So enteral feedings would be, for instance, uh, an, a nasogastric tube that goes through the nose and ends up in the stomach where um, oral nutritional or nutritional supplements are given. These young people can also be dependent on just oral nutritional supplements. And finally, these young people can have marked interference with their psychosocial functioning. Now, eating disorders are serious, potentially life-threatening conditions that affect a child or adolescent's emotional and physical health. They're not just a fad or a phase. Children do not catch an eating disorder. They are real, they are complex, and they are devastating conditions that can have serious consequences for health, for productivity, and for relationships. Eating disorders, as shown here on the slide, can affect every organ system in the body and children who are struggling with an eating disorder need to seek professional help. The earlier a young person with an eating disorder seeks treatment, the greater the likelihood of both physical and emotional recovery. Now, what are some of the general symptoms of eating disorders so that we can in fact identify these disorders early and treat them aggressively? Well, first of all, there could be unexplained weight loss or a young person expressing a fear of gaining weight or being overweight. These young people, as we've discussed, have distortions in the way in which they experience their body weight, their body shape, or their size. Young people can have little or no growth in height at an age when children should be growing and developing. And similarly, they could have little or no weight gain or even weight loss at a time when they should be gaining weight. 
Further, young people can have significant fluctuations in their weight. For instance, you can see them today, they're at a certain weight, and you see them in two weeks, they could either gain or lose two or three or four kilos. Young people may hide food. They may have purging behaviors, which could consist of vomiting or the use of diuretics, laxatives, or diet pills, or they could be excessively exercising all to lose weight. They may be preoccupied with thoughts of food, calories, exercise, and their weight. They may skip meals. And you may notice that where you would come home and you would be preparing dinner and the young person may say that they've already eaten. They may fast or they may eliminate entire food groups such as carbohydrates or fats. They may count calories or grams of fat. And this is often observed by reading food labels. Many of these young people with eating disorders prefer to eat alone. They don't want people judging what they're eating or encouraging them to eat more. They may have dysfunctions in their menstrual period, young girls, either amenorrhea, that means the absence of menses or a menstrual cycle, or they may have irregular menstrual periods. They may have delay of onset of puberty or delay of onset of their first menstrual period. They may withdraw from friends and family. Many of their social activities when you're an adolescent are around food, going to a movie and getting popcorn, getting together with friends and ordering a pizza. And unfortunately, these young people, their eating disorder won't allow them to do that. They often wear baggy clothes or layered clothing to hide their weight loss or to keep warm. Because of their loss of fat, they tend to want to keep in their meager energy stores that they have and therefore layer their clothing. You may observe that these young people continue to weight check either on the scale or examine themselves in the mirror. They're often reading food related magazines or cookbooks or recipes or watching cooking shows on TV. And often young people with eating disorders will cook and bake for others, but will rarely eat what they've cooked or baked for themselves. So what if you see one or more of these signs or symptoms in your child? I think overall, we need to be attentive to all the changes in our child's lives as they grow and develop. And we need to observe and monitor our child at home, in their school, in their academic process, in their social life, in their extracurricular activities. And if we see any of these signs and symptoms, I would not hesitate to approach the child with your concerns about their eating attitudes and behaviors, encouraging open dialogue, expression of thought and feeling, being sensitive and non-judgmental and listening without interruption. Here are some examples of ways that parents or caregivers may be able to broach the subject on these sensitive issues. For instance, I've noticed that you're losing a lot of weight. I'm worried that there may be something wrong with your health. Or I've noticed that you're very critical about your body weight and shape, and I'm worried that this is a problem for you. Or I'm concerned that the way you're feeling is affecting how you were eating. Again, I'm worried that this is a problem for you. Or I've noticed that you're going to the bathroom right after every meal and spending a long time in there. I can't help think that something's wrong. Can we talk about it? Being sensitive, non-judgmental, and listening carefully to the answers to these questions and leaving some room for open dialogue. So what if you indeed do see some of these disorders, these signs and symptoms of the disorder? We would encourage you to seek professional help for your child right away. Visiting a healthcare professional who's knowledgeable about the health and well-being of your child or adolescent is paramount. They will be able to make a clear assessment of the young person. If your child had a cough that wasn't getting better, as parents or caregivers, we wouldn't hesitate to take our child to the doctor. If our child is exhibiting signs or symptoms of an eating disorder, we really shouldn't hesitate to take our child to a doctor for an assessment. Parents, 
teachers, coaches, camp counselors, adults who work with children are in a unique position to detect the onset of incipient eating disorders, to watch, to listen, and to start a dialogue about this. And clinicians are also in a unique position to detect the onset of incipient eating disorders. By doing a history and a physical examination, we're in a great position to stop the progression at the earliest stages. Now, in the terms of the assessment, weight is not the only clinical marker of an eating disorder. Children and adolescents who are low weight, normal weight, and higher weights can have eating disorders. And when we do an assessment, we need to make sure that we do a developmentally sensitive history taking. And what I mean by that is at the beginning of this discussion, we talked about the fact that eating disorders affect children of all different ages. And so where you would might ask a seven-year-old one question, you might ask it very differently to a 17-year-old. But in all of this, we want to get to a variety of different items. The first is we want to really assess a young person's current dietary practices, the amount of food they're eating, the food groups, the fluids, and whether or not they're restricting. We want to know whether they're counting calories or fat grams and whether they have any scary foods or taboo foods, foods that they tend to avoid. We want to know whether or not they've recently become a vegan or a vegetarian or gluten-free or have any of the fad diets that they've integrated into their diet. We want to know whether they're skipping meals or have loss of appetite, whether they're binge eating. And if they are binge eating, how frequently they're doing that the amount of food that they're taking and whether or not there are any triggers. We also want to assess their purging behaviors, whether they're vomiting and if so, the frequency and how long after meals and how they are vomiting. Some young people can use their fingers, others need to use a foreign body and some young people can vomit spontaneously. We wanna know if they're using any medications, water pills like diuretics, laxatives, diet pills, Ipecac, or complementary and alternative medicines. We also want to explore their weight and shape concerns. Are they trying to lose weight? Are they fearful of becoming fat? Um, and if, do how they, they view themselves, if they're very, very thin, do they still think that they need to lose weight? We also want to assess their exercise if they are doing exercise, how much, how often, and the level of intensity, and whether or not they're stressed if they miss exercising. For young women, we do a thorough menstrual history, when they had their first menstrual period, when their last menstrual period was, if they're on any kind of contraception. And of course, in adolescence, we do a thorough sexual history. And in terms of family history, we want to know about eating disorders and other mental illnesses as uh, eating disorders do run in families. The clinician also should do a thorough physical examination and that physical examination should include doing a young person's weight and height and determining what we refer to as their body mass index and putting this on pediatric growth curves. We also want to check and see whether or not there are any previous points that we can put on these growth curves to make sure that young people are following their growth trajectory. So you can see here, if we look at the stature of this young person, they were following what we would refer to as the 25th percentile until they started restricting their intake and their stature leveled off. What we see with their weight, as soon as they started restricting, they went from above the 50th percentile here, which they had been following, to the third percentile. This kind of growth curve is quite worrisome. We also want to check whether or not puberty, sexual puberty, or development is proceeding in a normal manner. And so what we do is we do what is called sexual maturity rating or Tanner scale. Uh, the Tanner staging is an objective classification system that provides documentation and tracking of sexual development in children during puberty. So just to give you an example, somebody who hasn't reached puberty yet, 
would not have any breast or pubic hair development, whether you're a boy or a girl. And when you reach full adult height, you have full uh, pubic hair development and full breast development. And in between, you are maturing and there are different phases. Physicians will use this scale to help them see whether or not there is any delay in puberty which can occur with the onset of an eating disorder. And finally, we're going to monitor a young person's blood pressure and heart rate and oral temperature uh, and changes in blood pressure from lying to standing. These can be indications that a young person has suffered the repercussions from either weight loss or vomiting. And these are indicators of medical instability. So as I mentioned earlier, eating disorders are serious and potentially life-threatening conditions that affect a child or adolescent's physical health and every organ system in the body is affected. If we're looking at children and adolescents, not only is every system in the body affected, but there are unique medical complications in children and adolescents that really differ them from adults. These young people can have linear growth impairment or delay. They can have interruptions, as we mentioned, in their pubertal development. They can develop low bone mineral density and they can have structural and cognitive um, changes uh, in their brain. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the global medical complications and also the unique medical complications. So first let's look at the heart. The most common abnormality in a young person with an eating disorder, particularly anorexia nervosa is abnormal heart rhythms. And the most common one is that of what we call bradycardia or slow heart rates. There are different normal heart rates depending on the age of the child. But commonly what we see in young people who have lost a significant amount of weight is their heart rates during the day are below 50 beats per minute. In an adolescent who is 16 or 17, we should see their heart rates in the 70s. And younger children tend to have higher heart rates. But if you develop uh, anorexia nervosa as a result of weight loss, your heart rate tends to slow down. You also have changes in your heart rate and blood pressure from lying to standing. And this could be caused by just weight loss or dehydration. The other things we see in young people is that they have atrophy or decrease in size of their heart. Just as you look at them from the outside and they have loss of fat and muscle, their heart, the organ on the inside, has muscle atrophy or muscle decrease in size. In addition, some young people can have an enlargement of their heart, and this can be due to a variety of things, or one in particular, um, if young people take Ipecac, which is a medication that we often would have in our house to, um, if a young uh, person took some poison by mistake, we would give a child Ipecac to, to help them induce vomiting. Some young people abuse Ipecac to make themselves vomit, and one of the ramifications is that they can have an enlarged heart as a result of that. We call that cardiomyopathy. The other thing that we see, and this has been reported in young adults especially, a study um, has not been done in children around this, but in many of the patients we see at sick kids, if we were to do um, a test to look at the size of the heart and the shape of the heart, young people can have fluid around their heart. Um, it's a small amount of fluid, but it exists. However, this is quite reversible with weight restoration. Another complication that we see are that the electrolytes or the salts in patients with eating disorders can uh, be abnormal. Often uh, they are abnormally low. And this can be the result of young people vomiting or restricting their intake. It can be the result of the use of medications like diuretics or laxatives or it can be the result of dehydration. And the common electrolytes that we see are sodium, and this can cause things like dizziness or confusion or irritability or headache or restlessness or abnormal heart rhythms. We can see a decrease in magnesium, which can cause muscle weakness and cramps, impaired coordination and lethargy, anxiety, and again, abnormal heart rhythms and potassium. And potassium can cause bloating and distension, which is often a symptom that young people report. 
It can cause constipation. It can cause nausea and fatigue and also arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. There are a number of gastrointestinal issues which young people also experience. There's been very good studies that have shown that in fact, young people who lose a significant amount of weight also have delays in emptying their gut. And as a result of that, they experience abdominal bloating and pain. There have been studies that have looked at giving young people uh, medications to help with this delay of gastric emptying so that we can empty it quicker so that they don't have these uh, symptoms. But actually the best medicine for the delayed gastric emptying is food. And this will reverse over weeks and months. Young people also can have constipation. And as we saw on the last slide, this can be due to a number of things, one of which can be electrolyte abnormalities or salt abnormalities, or in fact, the fact that kids aren't eating enough food um, to have a normal bowel movement. And finally, some other things that can occur in young people with anorexia nervosa as a result of restricting their intake is that they can develop fatty infiltrates in their liver, which cause abnormal tests when you test the liver, but these are fully reversible with weight restoration and nutritional rehabilitation. If we look at some of the gut and oral effects of bulimia nervosa, they're slightly different and there's some similarities. These young people can develop dental enamel erosion. This does not occur necessarily in children, but it can occur in older adolescents and young adults. And this is the result of vomiting and bathing the teeth in the acidic vomit. It can also occur as a result of the binging and binging on high carbohydrate foods. Another complication is parotid swelling. If we were to look at this young person face on, what you would see is like a chipmunk like facies. So the angle of the jaw, there's a parotid gland and that becomes swollen. This too is fully reversible. And this is a result of again, vomiting and stimulating the parotid gland in the inside of the mouth and it becomes swollen. Another complication of young people who vomit is the Mallory Weiss tears. And this is a tear of the tissue of the lower esophagus. And it is uh, most often caused by retching or vomiting. The symptoms of the Mallory Weiss tear are blood streak vomit or black or tar-like stools. And this can be reversed um, just by stopping vomiting and giving the gut a rest. Finally, some other complications that can occur are gastric reflux and pancreatitis. And of course, life-threatening esophageal rupture from the increased pressure from vomiting, it can cause the esophagus or the stomach to rupture. And that is a life-threatening event. I'd like to move on now to talk a little bit about menstrual dysfunction. Now, prior to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual's fifth edition, amenorrhea was actually a criteria that was used in diagnosing young people with anorexia nervosa. This is still a very common clinical um, characteristic of young people, but we do not use it as part of the um, criteria. Many young people present to us with either amenorrhea or irregular menstrual function. And this is really a complex multifactorial interplay of factors that cause this amenorrhea or irregular menstrual function. We know that weight is paramount. Uh, normal weight for a young person is paramount in order to have normal menstrual periods. You need body fat because that's where estrogen is made and estrogen is really important to having a normal menstrual period. We know that young people who overexercise are at risk for not having a menstrual period. We know that hormones are extremely important to have a normal menstrual period. Estrogen 
uh, is paramount to having uh, a normal menstrual period. We also know that there have been studies that have looked at mood and abnormal eating behaviors that also contribute to the irregular menstrual function or the amenorrhea. Now, the return of menses is a really good biologic marker of physical health, and we use that most often. We know that greater than 85% of the young people that we see will have return of menses within six months of their predicted treatment goal weight or progress weight. We use those, weight, we use those terminologies interchangeably. There's been one study that looked at the fact that young people will start to menstruate at about two kilos above the weight in which they lost their menstrual period. So that's another marker that we use to help determine the goal weight or the progress weight. Now, when you're not menstruating, you put yourself at risk for poor bone health. And bone health is really, really important in young people. Adolescence is a really critical time for bone mass accrual. In fact, young people, young girls, increase their bone up until about the age of 16 or two years post-menarche, and young boys increase their weight up until about age 18. So we also know that adolescence is a critical time for the development of an eating disorder. The most common ages for the development of an eating disorder is between about 15 and 19 years of age, a time when peak bone mass accrual is really, really important. So if one were to develop an eating disorder during this time of peak bone mass, they may not attain their peak bone mass and go into adulthood with a lower peak bone mass than they normally would. This puts them at great risk for fracture and morbidity. So when we think about what causes this low bone mineral density that we see in patients, we know that there's significant hormonal disturbance. We know that young people uh, have growth hormone, which is made in their pituitary gland. And uh, in young people with anorexia nervosa who are at very low weights, their uh, growth hormone seems to be resistant and not working properly. These young people have low estrogen in girls and low testosterone in boys. They have high cortisol levels and cortisol, we know, um, causes low bone mineral density, another important hormone. We know that low body mass in and of itself can cause low bone mass. And these young people are not eating well. And often before they get into treatment, they have low calcium and low vitamin D intake. And so all of these things together will cause low bone mass. So in young people, we recommend that um, they evaluate their low bone mineral density using what we call a DEXA scan. That stands for dual x-ray absorbed geometry. And we usually recommend that the first scan be after six months of not having a period and that, that they have their um, scan done yearly thereafter if they haven't menstruated. We also know that the treatment for low bone mineral density is weight restoration, even before the return of menses. Weight restoration is the safest and fastest way to increase bone mineral density. We also recommend calcium intake, at 1300 milligrams per day, vitamin D intake at 600 international units. And there is some thought that the birth control pill helps bone mineral density. In studies that we've done, and in studies that um, others have done, the birth control pill, just because it has estrogen, does not increase bone mineral density. So again, the, the three most Important things here is weight restoration with the return of menses and making sure that we have adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. We also know that children and adolescents are vulnerable to impaired linear growth and short stature if indeed these young people are not diagnosed early and treated aggressively. And most of the changes that cause this dysregulation and impaired linear growth have to do with the hormones 
uh, in, the, in the brain, in the pituitary gland, and in the end organs. So thyroid hormones, adrenal hormones, sex hormones, and growth hormone all participate in this poor linear growth that we see in young people. I showed you an, a growth curve earlier. This is another growth curve to show you what we often see in young people when they have linear growth impairment. You can see here that this young person, again, was following the 10th percentile and she lost a significant amount of weight. Now she's on the fifth percentile and what happened to her growth is that it also fell off the curve. And this was the growth curve that I showed you earlier. Again, not uncommon to see a young person's growth uh, just stagnant over time, if not treated aggressively. Now, some of the things that are important, uh, the onset before their first menstrual period of an eating disorder is associated with growth delay, but catch-up growth can occur. And it can occur with refeeding. One needs to be aggressive with the treatment and unrelenting. We do not give into the eating disorder. There's been studies that have shown that if you um, uh, are unrelenting and push the child to regain the weight that they've lost without ups and downs and ups and downs, that the catch up growth can occur. Let's talk a little bit about eating disorders and the brain. Now, adolescence is also a critical period for structural brain and cognitive development. There have been studies using magnetic resonance imaging or MRIs that have shown that the um, material in the brain, so we've got fluid, we call it cerebrospinal fluid, we've got white matter and gray matter increase um, in young people. So there are increases normally in white matter and gray matter. And um, we were interested and others have been interested to see what happens uh, with starvation. And what we've managed to show is that in young people who are, uh, have acute anorexia nervosa, there are changes that occur. There's increases in uh, the fluid volumes, the cerebral spinal fluid, and there are decreases in that two matters that are found in the brain, gray and white matter. And uh, both the gray matter deficits and the CSF, uh, cerebral, sp cerebral spinal fluid um, elevations uh, uh, do persist in some of these young people, even when their weight recovered. So I'm going to just take you to the coronal section here to show you an example of some of these residual effects. And what you see here is in control patients, their volumes are the green. And if you have anorexia nervosa, you can see that there is an increase in cerebral spinal fluid, and that is shown in the red. We also have done studies looking at cognitive function in young people with anorexia nervosa, and we have found that there are deficits across a broad neuropsychological domains, whether it be memory, executive function, or visuospatial ability. And um, it is unclear whether or not these uh, cognitive functions recover fully and equally across these various domains. I also want to talk a little bit about bone marrow suppression. So bone marrow is what is inside an individual's bones. And in that bone marrow, that's where the uh, bloodlines are developed. So we've got white blood cells, we've got red blood cells, and we've got platelets. And these are really, really important to fight off infection. And what we have found in young people who um, have lost a significant amount of weight is that they don't produce these bloodlines as well as healthy young people. They have low white blood counts. They often have uh, low red blood counts and they can sometimes have low platelets. And um, there is some question as to whether or not they are what we would refer to as immunosuppressed, unable to mount a response to infection. Um, some young people 
um, cannot mount uh, a normal response to an infection. Often they can't uh, mount a febrile response. And if a young person does have an infection and has uh, anorexia nervosa, we really do worry about their ability to be able to diagnose these infections quickly. So we have to be extremely sensitive uh, if a young person is not feeling well, we have to take that very, very seriously. I also want to talk about some of the skin findings or what we refer to as dermatologic findings. These young people often have poor, what we call peripheral perfusion because their heart isn't working as well uh, as it should be. They have a difficult time pushing out the blood to the extremities. And often what you'll find is that these young people have um, blue hands and feet. In addition, they may have what you see here on the left hand side of the uh, slide is um, what we call pitting edema. So they have swelling in their feet, they can have swelling in their hands, they can have swelling in um, their lower back. And again, this is a result of either um, their cardiac function, or it may be a result of some of the salt and protein in their blood. On the right side, what you see is what we refer to as lanugo hair. And um, these young people will develop hair on their body, either their back, their upper torso, the upper parts of their leg. And this is sort of fine downy hair that we believe is grown as a result of the meager energy stores uh, that these children and adolescents have. And this is a way of keeping in those uh, meager energy stores and keeping the young person warm. Some other findings, uh, this hand here shows dry hands. Some of this is just due to poor nutrition. Other, when we see dry hands like that, we want to explore other causes of dry hands, including obsessive compulsive disorder. Young people complain that their hair is falling out and it is a very real finding. Uh, this too is reversible once young people start eating properly and our weight uh, are nutritionally rehabilitated. And finally, on the right-hand side, you see dry burial nails, which is also another finding. We also wanna be cognizant of the fact that um, some young people have self-injurious behaviors. And this is an important finding to find and explore with the young person. And finally, this is Russell's sign. And this is a callus that forms on the dorsum of the hand of a young person who uses their fingers to self-induce vomiting. So they take their um, two fingers or one finger, they stick it down the throat, they elicit the gag reflex, and their front teeth hit the top of their hand. And if you do that two or three times a day, you develop this callus on the dorsum of the hand called Russell's sign. Now, all of this is to say that as clinicians, we take a good history, we do a physical exam looking for all of these signs and symptoms, and then we need to make a decision as to whether or not a young person requires admission to hospital. And the kinds of things that may be an indication for hospitalization include such things as weight loss that's either been severe or rapid or both, Young people who are dehydrated and have electrolyte disturbances. I'm just going to ask who, if, if everybody could move, mute themselves. I do hear some background noise that may be difficult for others to hear. Um, we, we talked about um, irregular heart rhythms. Uh, these also can be indications for uh, admission to hospital. Low blood pressure, low body temperature, uh, young people, um, especially younger children who have arrested growth and development, those young people who outpatient treatment has been tried or day treatment has been tried and, um, uh, and has failed, those young people who have acute food refusal, um, other young people who have uncontrollable binging and purging, young people who have fainting or seizures or confusion, 
And finally, any psychiatric emergency, uh, suicidal thoughts or severe depression that may um, on its own or may interfere with the treatment of the eating disorder. I think what's important to remember is that children and adolescents can fully recover from all types of eating disorders and that the outcome is much better for young people with eating disorders who are identified early and get treatment early on. Now, we expect recovery to look like what we see on the left, a straight arrow to recovery, but we know in reality, children and adolescents don't have a straight recovery and there are ups and downs. But full recovery does occur, again, as I said, for all types of eating disorders. And it's important to get these young people identified early and treated aggressively. One more point about recovery, and that is we expect and hope for all of our children and adolescents that they be happy, be healthy, and be carefree. And that really is what we are going for in these young people who are struggling with these life-threatening disorders. I want to talk a little bit about treatment. Um, we know that children and adolescents with eating disorders, at least at our clinic here at the Hospital for Sick Children, rarely come in wanting treatment. They often don't think they have a problem with eating disorders and that they don't need help. They often lack insight and often they don't really understand the severity or the consequences of these illnesses. And parents and caregivers really are our customers. The key elements to treatment when we um, have a family who presents with a young person who's suffering from an eating disorder is that we have an interdisciplinary team. We um, recognize that there are all different kinds of treatment settings, whether it be inpatient, day treatment, outpatient or residential. And when we evaluate a young person, we keep that in mind. It's important that um, the person who is treating a young person have expertise in child and adolescent eating disorders. And as I've said before, we really have to be quite aggressive with the treatment. And finally, we need to support and engage the family in the treatment since they're often the people who are our customers. The goals of treatment really fit into sort of six categories, if you will. Weight restoration, we want to treat the acute medical complications, many of which we've just discussed. We want to prevent any long-term medical complications, many of which we've just discussed. And then finally, later on in the treatment, and this occurs after these, um, the, the weight restoration and the treatment of the acute medical complication, is the normalization of eating, disorder, uh, of eating patterns. And throughout this whole treatment goal, we want to support and engage family in treatment, and of course, the child or adolescent. When we talk about weight restoration, there are some pretty good literature that has recently come out that says that we can start at higher energy intake than had been done previously. Uh, we were always very worried that starting low was the right way to go because we were worried that we would push, push these kids into what we refer to as the refeeding syndrome. So a refeeding syndrome is a syndrome whereby um, uh, when young people haven't seen um, food for a long time and they're given particularly carbohydrates, there's lots of shifts or there is the potential for lots of shifts of these salts that we talked about earlier and it can cause things like the heart not to work properly. But what we have found is that instead of starting really low, and some people started at 600 kilocalories when young people came into hospital, we can start at much higher uh, kilocalories safely and efficiently. So often uh, what we do here is we start young people at about 1500 kilocalories a day and move up uh, fairly aggressively, but watching them uh, on cardiac monitor and examining them daily and checking their electrolytes. We also want to make sure that um, we treat any of the acute medical complications that we've talked about today. 
And then we want to prevent long-term medical complications. And this is usually done by treating the acute complications and also doing a fairly aggressive weight restoration. As I said, normalization of eating patterns comes a bit later on, but throughout this entire process, we're supporting the family and the child. And of course, for young people who uh, are admitted for uh, weight restoration and um, uh, nutritional rehabilitation, as soon as they're able, uh, they are discharged from hospitals so that they, as a first line treatment, can engage in intensive outpatient treatment, um, uh, family-based therapy. And I'm sure many of you are aware of this treatment where the family plays or the parents play an active and positive role in order to help restore their child's weight and to assist the child in taking charge of their own uh, weight restoration. And then of course, establishing um, and, and, and sort of focusing on a young person's identity and development. And this is divided into, uh, of course, the three phases to look at each of those. We know that family-based therapy as an outpatient therapy is um, more effective than individual uh, treatment. It is an outpatient therapy and um, it can either be given as 10 sessions over six months or 20 sessions over 12 months. And it is very effective uh, for young people. And here are some resources for parents um, on the treatment. We also know that um, ARFID being a relatively new diagnosis, um, there are lots of studies um, ongoing now looking at uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for ARFID and family-based therapy for ARFID. So I think I will end here and I want um, you to, um, the take home points for today's discussion include the fact that early diagnosis and aggressive treatment is vital in children and adolescents with eating disorders. We know that children and adolescents with eating disorders have unique medical complications. If not treated aggressively, may not be reversible. And children and adolescents with eating disorders do recover. I also want to suggest the um, new eating disorder guide to medical care. These are medical care standards guide by the American Academy, by the Academy for Eating Disorders. Um, you can get this on the Academy for Eating Disorder website. And um, although it is very geared to clinicians, I encourage parents to review it as well because if um, they do have a sick child, you can refer to this guide to help you make sure that your child gets the, the care and the assessment that they need. And I think I will stop here and answer any questions. Um, thank you. That was the most comprehensive presentation I think I've ever experienced. Um, you covered a tremendous amount of ground in a very short amount of time. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I'm just gonna dig in. Um, one of our questions is whether you can speak to weight restoration goals in adolescents who were previously overweight. Is it true that they can return to the 50th percentile for BMI weight, or do they need to return to overweight to sustain recovery? So that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. And I think it's something that as researchers, we are looking into, um, you know, we don't have the answer to that, uh, but I can tell you, as um, I spoke to, I think, um, earlier, one of the things that we do use as a marker, a biologic marker, is the resumption of menstrual periods. And also, we uh, look at um, normalization of the eating patterns. So both of those things are really paramount. The exact weight or how we actually figure out that weight for those who had been previously overweight um, is something that I know is being studied right now. And so hopefully we'll have that information soon. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um... Another question, um, if a person's period returns after six months, um, should they check for bone material density, sorry, bone mineral density? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so um, you, you know, 
your doctor can be the one to help you make that decision. I don't think it's a bad idea that if you haven't had your period for six months and it, then it returns that you get a second DEXA to make sure that in fact, your bone mineral density is continuing to increase and not decrease. Okay. It, I know in the US, it all depends on insurance as well, but if, if you were here, I would, I, would, I would do another one in a year's time. Um, when can one expect the start of menses in a child who never had menses, meaning a younger child? Right. So that's another million dollar question. So one of the parameters that we use, um, and this is a common adolescent pearl, is that young people should menstruate within a year of when their mothers menstruated. So if a young person is 13 years old and, uh, and her mother menstruated when she was uh, 14, we would expect her to menstruate within a year. If that doesn't happen and you're still, still suspicious that uh, this young person uh, is at a low weight, there are some other things that you can do. Um, what we do primarily in young people who have secondary amenorrhea or those who have lost their menstrual period um, is that we, um, we have very good um, radiologists here who do ultrasounds. And um, if we're suspicious that a young person actually should be menstruating at the weight they are and they're within a year of their mother's menstrual period, uh, we might get a pelvic ultrasound. And that pelvic ultrasound would be looking at the size of the uterus and the size and morphology of the ovaries. So we want as a young person is about to menstruate, their ovaries are a particular size and they have lots of follicles in them and one dominant follicle. And the uterus is also pear-shaped instead of tear-shaped and it may have an endometrial lining. So that can give you a bit of a clue as to whether or not you're close to the right weight. Um, okay. Um, we're Three minutes in, so you're gonna to have to answer this next one pretty quick. Um, please address how bradycardia and orthostasis is affected when anorexia relapse occurs, i.e. is damage cumulative? We're not aware that damage is cumulative, but what we do know from our own clinical experience is that we tend to see that second and third admissions, bradycardia, uh, and blood pressure changes tend to take a bit of a longer time to get back to normal with each and every additional admission. And I, we don't know or understand the pathophysiology for that. Okay, I'm just gonna ask one more. Um, someone said her daughter's been on a combined birth control pill for a few years to help manage her hormones. Do you think this is a risk to bone density, et cetera? So I don't know that it's a risk to bone density, but I do think that what it, it's not gonna help the bone density. And the other thing that it may do is give the young person a false hope that they're menstruating at their well. Um, my recommendation, um, unless they need it for birth control, and that's a whole other issue. If they need it for birth control, they need it. But if they don't need it for birth control and they're just using it, uh, in thinking that it's going to help their bone density, it's not going to help their bone density. Um, and someone asked whether um, we would be able to receive a copy of your slides. Um, sure. I don't know what your policy is on that. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Um, all right, well, we'll have to figure out how to get them to people. Um, stay tuned, everyone, for more information on that. Um, I'd like to end um, by thanking Dr. Katzman for an incredible webinar, really packed with information that's so valuable for all the people that attended. Um, I would also just like to tell you all um, that FEAST relies on donations to sustain itself and to run programs like this. So if you like this webinar, please consider donating to FEAST. Um, this is the link. Um, and I also wanted to just encourage everyone to attend next month's webinar. Um, our November webinar, um, there is a slide that should come up because I don't know the date. Thank you. November 10th is our next webinar. Um, Dr. Lauren Mulheim will be speaking on what caregivers should know about CBT and DBT. 
I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating webinar, so please register. Registration should be open shortly after the closing of this webinar. So we're at time. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Katzman, for presenting. And we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thank you very much.